I'm here to talk about auto-regulating strength training today. And uh, just a heads up, I tend to, to nerd things up a little bit. So we're going we're gonna to get kind of on the uh, more analytical side of lifting weights today. But hopefully it's useful for you and hopefully it's something that you guys enjoy. Um, before we get started, auto-regulating strength training, like what that is, um, auto-regulation just means to adjust your training um, to fit the, your current needs. Usually, we're, when we talk about auto-regulation, we're talking about daily adjustments to the training based on how you're going to perform that day or some other criteria. So first, let's talk about why you should even listen to me. Um, some of my personal achievements, uh, I've done most of my competitive powerlifting in USA Powerlifting and the IPF. Uh, I've won USA Powerlifting Nationals seven times. I've medaled five different times at IPF World Events. And in 2009, uh, I was the first USA Powerlifting male to win a gold medal at the World Games. If you don't know what the World Games are, uh, it's an event that's organized by the Olympic Committee for sports that are trying to get into the Olympics. It's uh, once every four years, they take the, the top 40 uh, lifters from IPF World Events and in, then invite them uh, to this competition. It's a way for, for lifters to represent powerlifting, not just among other powerlifters, but to other sports and to the world as a whole. Um, so I was able to go to Taiwan and win a gold medal at that event, which uh, was probably the, the coolest powerlifting experience I've ever had. Um, but I'm not just genetically lucky. Some guys, you know, are, I, won't, I won't argue that I'm not genetically lucky, but it's, that's not the only thing that's going on with reactive training systems. Uh, this year, in June, I brought uh, six lifters that I coach to uh, the IPF Classic World Cup. Uh, I've coached 19 national champions. Uh, these are national champions of legit national federations, not just uh, whatever backyard event. They have one competition a year and call it nationals. Um, I've coached three different IPF world record holders, different multiply powerlifters, uh, Arnold Classic, Raw Unity, all kinds of different powerlifters. I've uh, been very fortunate and done, done well with coaching. Um, so enough about that, but let's get back into auto-regulation. The first thing I want to tell you about auto-regulation is that you're doing it wrong. Okay, not, you're not really doing it wrong, but you maybe are doing it right. Um, but a lot of people are doing it wrong. And I've got a couple examples up here of guys that, different kinds of people that you see who think that they're doing auto-regulation, but they're messing it up. Uh, there's Magic Bullet program guy who uh, has to have a program that they feel is, is perfect for all circumstances and all situations. And if I just do this program, then I'll get stronger. If I just do this program over and over, then I'll get stronger indefinitely. Uh, also kind of growing in popularity lately, there's the how you feel is a lie guy. Uh, it's becoming more popular to say things like how you feel is a lie, you should not listen to your body and things like that. I, disagree with that. I see where they're coming from and we'll get more into that in a minute, but uh, I, I don't, don't agree that how you feel is a lie. Um, there's also I need a deload week guy who every time they have a bad workout, every time something feels heavy or off a little bit, it's oh, I'm overtrained, I need a deload week. Um, also that's not auto regulation. Um, also there's the Joe Weider instinctive training guy, every day is chest and buys. Uh, that kind of thing. That's also not auto-regulation at all. So you see that the first two in this group, um, they're not really using any auto-regulation, or at least not very much. The, the first one is relying on a program to be perfect, and the second one is pretty much doing the same thing by saying how you feel is a lie. The thing is that the human body is not a math problem and it's got a lot more complexity than what we're capable of, of fully understanding and fully predicting. So there has to be some sort of adjustment based on real life circumstances. That in real life, 
things go well or things don't go well. You get more sleep than you thought or you get fired from your job or something like that. There's, there's always externalities. Now the second two are overly reliant on their emotions and they use that as auto-regulation. Um, there's a relatively new field of science called psychoneuroimmunology. Uh, that's a field of study that studies how uh, psychology, the way you think, neurobiology, the way that your brain is wired, and your immune system all interact together. Okay, So how you think affects your immune system, what your immune system does affects your neurobiology, and all these things interrelate. And it's in a way more complicated fashion than just um, a simple two-factor model. Um, the problem, and why that relates to these, uh, to these second two examples, is that the second two examples tend to overreact to emotion. And I see that that's what a lot of people do when they think, I've got to listen to my body. They tend to overreact to the emotion of the day. Um, that's good for like survival situations, but sports success is about taking your, taking your level beyond, uh, taking your performance beyond what normal physiology uh, would, would allow. Uh, this Um, we'll see. As far as like how to how to assign it, uh, if you're if you're doing some programming, I would tend to go just blanket medium across the board. Start there, and then identify certain weeks as going to be low stress weeks. So if you got a vacation or you're doing a deload for a meet or the first week back from a layoff or something like that, those are going to be obvious low stress weeks. Then. Uh, you can mix in some high stress weeks if you've got, like say you've got a, a block of five weeks where it's all, all listed as medium. I would go in there and say one of them or maybe two of them would be high stress. And then if you need to, you can, mix, you can put some low stress in after that. Um, you can say, well, here's a high stress week, so we'll follow that with a low stress week. And you just kind of, it's kind of this uh, iterative process. You just kind of go in a loop until you're satisfied with it. Uh, but yeah, I would start with blanket medium. And if you're in doubt, I would go with medium. So it's not something where you kind of do it as you go along, so you program basically the medium stress with you. Mm -hmm. And you notice that the drop sets continually are increasing. Mm -hmm. Doing more and more drop sets, or you're continually doing consistent drop sets. You're doing a high stress week to see how you acclimate or tolerate. I tend not to, to change it on the fly, like in the midst of a, in the midst of a cycle. And that's just kind of my process, that when I'm starting out and when I'm doing the planning, I kind of go through the weeks like that and, and scrub it out. Um, so I wouldn't want to have like just kind of a random high stress week in there without really thinking it through, because maybe there's a, an important training session coming up and I don't want to be uh, fatigued for it or something like that. So I want to get into uh, another system that we've developed uh, called TRAC. Um, TRAC stands for the Training Recovery Assessment Computer. It just, it's just a test that we've come up with. It's on our, it's on our website. Um, that gives us some more information about how your body's processing stress. And to kind of give you an example of what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to start out with uh, what I call the car analogy. So if you think of, of um, reaching your performance goals is like a, like a road map, right? or like, a, like you're planning a road trip. Yeah. Um, so where you're at right now is point A, and then you figure out where your goal is, is point B, and you set the plan. You, know, you set up your, your training plan, and that's like, uh, that's like planning your route on your road trip, right? Now, a normal road trip is pretty easy. It's pretty straightforward. You just kind of figure out where you're going to go, you get in the car, and you go. Right. This is a little different. If you were just trying to get in shape, or just trying to, to lose some pounds or, or get a little stronger, that would work. And you could just kind of figure out what you wanted to do, go to the gym, lift some weights, and you'd be good. Uh, but probably by virtue of the fact that you're sitting in this room, what you want to achieve, your point B, is like at the limit of your potential. 
So you got to imagine that you're planning this road trip and, and for your car, it's like at the very limit of what this car can do. So you've got to, you've got to really meticulously plan this out and, and do things right or else you won't get there. Yeah. So you plan out, plan out your training cycle, which is like plotting your route. Yeah. Um, but if point B, say you're planning your road trip and point B is, is north, uh, you may not plan to go just directly north. Maybe that's not a really great route. Maybe you go east for a while and then north. So what that means is in your training, if you're trying to develop maximal strength, maybe you just don't train maximal strength all the time. Maybe there's times that you train hypertrophy or some other strength objectives that relate to maximal strength that move you along your journey but aren't direct uh, direct uh, kind of a, a direct approach. So you can kind of think of RPE as a compass that you put in your car and that helps you with your direction to make sure that uh, you, if you remember RPE helps you auto regulate the intensity and intensity determines your training effect. So RPE is like a compass that you put in your car. It makes sure that the direction that you're going is the direction that you want to go. It makes sure that the weight on the bar is appropriate to get you in toward the goals that, you, that you've set out for yourself. Fatigue percents, like we said, this uh, point B, this, the destination that you're going for, is at the very limit of what the car can do. It's at the very limit of, of your capabilities. So. If you push it too hard, thinking back to the, the car, if you push it too hard, maybe the engine overheats. And then if you don't push it hard, hard enough, maybe you never get there. So you can think of fatigue percents as working with the terrain that you're going with, right? So if there's an uphill, fatigue percents make sure that you don't push it quite as hard so you don't overheat the engine, you know? And then if there's a downhill, fatigue percents turn it up a little bit so you can make some better time, you know?